Thank you. Okay, thank you for joining us. This is the August business meeting for the Yakima School District Board of Directors. Um, Barb, are we recording and live streaming yet? Okay. So for those of you who may not be aware, um, we do record our meetings and those recordings are available um, up on our YouTube channel about a week after the meeting um, takes place. And we also live stream these meetings so that someone, if they can't be here, can uh, join us via the internet. Um, and so both of those things have been activated now. And um, do we have interpretation services tonight? Do we have somebody that can announce that? Tenemos servicios de interpretación para los que se necesitan. Si usted es uno de estas personas, levanta la mano, por favor. Hector, ¿está bien? No, nope, I think we're all good. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Green. Okay, um, first order of business tonight is the um, Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to ask um, Director Navarro to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Raymond. And Graciela, could you read the land acknowledgement, please? Yes. Today, the schools of the Yakima School District rest on the ancestral lands of the 14 confederated tribes and bands of the Yakima Nation. The people of Yakima Nation inhabited more than 12 million acres across Adams, Benton, Chelan, Douglas, Franklin, Grant, Kittitas, Klickitat, and Yakima counties. Today, we honor those native peoples who are tied to the land through history, legends, and culture. We acknowledge their descendants who live in the world today. We thank the caretakers of this land who have lived here and continue to live here since time immemorial. An acknowledgement is a simple, powerful way to show respect and a step toward correcting the stories and practices that erase indigenous people's history and culture. It also honors the truth. As a school district, we will continue to build upon our relations with the Yakima Nation. Thank you, Graciela. Do you have something you want to bring forward? Yes. Uh, Martha, I'd like to recommend that we um, table. table agenda item D1, building improvement plans. There's quite a lot of content in there and I um, think it would um, be an opportunity for the board to uh, uh, review those improvement plans in, uh, more comprehensively with additional time. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Ooh. I want to push that one away a little bit. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we uh, table the school improvement plan discussion and, and subsequent action um, until next Monday at our Monday afternoon meeting. Um, is there any discussion? Jenny, do you want to give us a little background on the school improvement plans? Yes, happy to. Thank you, Board President Rice. Um, they are comprehensive and school improvement planning is truly an ongoing process in our district. Our principals work together with their instructional leadership teams throughout the year to update those plans based on the success of the action items, the learning steps, initiatives that are occurring within each building. So each building's plan ranges from probably nine to about 20 pages in length depending upon the additional information that gets added throughout the year. So the board is required to approve the plans annually. The plans that you have for review at this time are from last school year. So you're gonna be seeing really their end of year report. So there's also mid-year information where they started the year. So that is really why they are so lengthy. 
we will be bringing you back the 22-23 school improvement plans around November as we finalize the goals for this upcoming year. So you'll see them a much earlier um, and happy to present that in whatever way the board would like going into the future for the approval. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we table the school improvement plans till next Monday's meeting. Um, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Carries 5-0. Thank you all. Barb, could you add that to next week's um, agenda, please? Thank you. Next, we have um, a couple of remembrances. We've lost a couple of our um, school district family members over this past month. And I'd like to take a moment to um, read a summary of their obituary that was published in the paper, and then we'll have a moment of silence. The first one is for Catherine Ann Caldwell from December 30, 1950 to July 1, 2022. Catherine Caldwell grew up with two special moms, Jean in her early life and Gloria in many years, in many years as well as her amazing dad, Toby, who was at Catherine's, who was Catherine's loving rock. She grew up with four siblings in the house and later happily welcomed three more into her life. She loved them all. Catherine spent a lot of time with her family and her sisters were true soul sisters. They spent a lot of time together, laughing, discussing the world over dinner, traveling, swimming, reminiscing, and just loving each other's company. Catherine was married for 17 years to Don Caldwell and had three children that she loved very much. She worked very hard all of her life, especially in her early life, taking on two jobs and raising her kids as a single mom. There was not a more determined woman that did the best she could for her kids. She had many friends, most were longtime buddies, and it was easy to sit and talk about high school, everyone's families unfolding, the many trips, dinners, movies, and visits everywhere. The many friends she made at her jobs, at school, and all through life were an, also important to her. Catherine's heart had room for all of them, and they had room for her. Catherine leaves behind a daughter, a son, and a host of nieces, nephews, and their children, two sisters, two brothers, and the most incredible of a friend and lifelong sister, Zoe, Catherine Ann Caldwell. Next is um, Tina Jansen. From May 3rd, 1944 to July 27, 2022. Tina Jansen was born in Yakima, Washington. As a young girl, she started working in her mother's restaurant. She went on to work at a number of local restaurants before pursuing a career as a school bus driver for the Yakima School District for 26 years. Tina loved the kids on her bus and they felt the same about her. There were many that told her that she was their best bus driver ever. She maintained relationships with former students, including Maggie, who she had a very special bond with and who became a member of the family. Tina is survived by her husband, Jim Jansen, daughter, Teresa and Todd Trepanier, daughter, Christina and Brian Miller, five grandchildren, Tara and Tim Smith, Dustin Miller and Kelsey Smith, Trent and Sierra Trepanier, Matthew Miller and Bernadette Gagné, and Parker Miller, and six great-grandchildren. Tina Jansen. Please join me in a moment of silence to remember our, our family members from the district and um, send a, a, our thoughts to their families.
Thank you very much. Our condolences to the families and friends of Tina Jansen and Catherine Caldwell. Uh, next we have recognition of visitors and guests. Do we have anyone you'd specifically like to introduce? No, okay. All old friends. Okay, next we have acknowledgement of accomplishments and recognitions. Um, Dr. Green, would you like to make this recognition announcement? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, members of the board and friends and family here this evening. It's my pleasure to invite uh, Principal Maria Lucero to come up here to the front at the mic. And you can bring your family members if you'd like. Or if they want to stay back and not join you, they can stay there too. Because you are on your own. <laughs> so we are here uh, in part to acknowledge the great work of uh, uh, Principal Maria Lucero. And she's being recognized uh, through the Washington Association of School Administrators, WASA, as the Howard J. Cobble Scholarship uh, for underrepresented educational leaders, which she uh, was awarded uh, most recently in, I think it was happened in June. So uh, I'll just share with you some of the notes here. Uh, Maria Lucero, principal at MLK, was selected as the recipient of the 2022 Howard J. Cobble Scholarship. It was presented and uh, the wonderful thing about uh, the recipient of this scholarship is this is only the fourth time that it has been awarded. It's a recent scholarship that's uh, uh, distributed through uh, WASA and they in their letter shared uh, the following uh, paragraph that I'll share with you. Congratulations on your selection as a 2022 recipient. Uh, it, the application review committee was impressed with a strong pool of applicants and their inspirational stories. However, your application stood out in the eyes of the committee and she does have a wonderful story that one day we're gonna pry out of her and she's gonna be sharing with the entire district on how she has been able to uh, rise to the ranks of leadership and everything that she's overcome because she truly is a role model uh, for our community, uh, for our students, uh, for our Latinx community, and especially our uh, little brown girls in our district that can see you in the hallways every day and the work that you do. So it's a true honor to uh, share with her uh, in just a moment this uh, wonderful signed uh, certificate of recognition by the board. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, uh, the award ceremony uh, in Spokane, they still rave about the acceptance speech. It was phenomenal. <laughs> she was unable to make it, so I had to accept it for her. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was so nice to be able to stand in proxy and to share uh, a little bit about you. And I think I did take more time than anybody else at the mic, uh, letting them know how important it was to have you recognized and to seek out uh, leaders who represent their communities in many different ways. So. Uh, thank you, congratulations, and we invite you to say a few words. So. Chair for you. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. 
What? Sure. Maria, as always, the board has questions for you. <laughs> Your favorite class is cool. Okay, now you're on the hot seat. Okay. Raymond, do you have a question? Sure, since you got a scholarship, I'm just wondering about the degree program or what program you're in now and what are your plans for furthering your education? So I'm real curious about that. Yes, so I just completed this past June my first year in the Leadership for Learning program at the University of Washington and started my second year this past summer, actually in July, spent a week there. Um, and so should be graduating 2024. And um, actually, I've been able to already apply a lot of my a lot of my learning in my site with my staff, um, really centered on equity and dismantling systems that um, are inequitable for our students or prevent access, especially for students who are traditionally marginalized. So for us, our English learners. Um, our brown students, um, yeah. Does that mean we'll be calling you Dr. Lucero? Oh my gosh. Soon? In, the, in another <laughs> yeah. year? Is it a doctoral program? It is. Okay. Yes. Awesome. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank so, you. I'm sure we will know when you pass. <laughs> yes. Because we have a superintendent that's kind of proud of you. Any other questions for Maria? Thank you so much. I, I do think you. Dr. Rodriguez wanted to know what school you're attending for that degree. Oh, the, the University of Washington. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a little cross. There's a little cross state rivalry. Yeah, there. I can see that. <laughs> no other questions. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for thank joining you us tonight. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have a, a flurry of reports. Uh, first reports are from members of the board. Does any board member have anything that they'd like to share with the rest of us? No, okay. Um, this is the week for amendments for the State School Directors Association General Assembly um, for the proposals that will come before the assembly at the end of September. Does anyone have any amendments that they would like to propose from our board? Okay. The process does require that the board approve the amendment um, before it goes on to the final process. Um, and then I think it's next week, the um, amended proposals will be reviewed by the maker the proposer of the 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 proposer of the proposal and um was the staff and i think selected members of the legislative committee so we'll see next week if there are any to that have been amended um also we have um what is this? Some dates for the review, tentative dates for the review of our policy governance policies that we were unable to get to at the retreat. Um, so we're calling this Retreat 2.0. Um, Wednesday, the September 7th at 4 p.m. or Thursday, September 8th at 5 p.m. Is there 
anyone for whom one of, of those, one or both of those dates doesn't work. Okay. Because I want all of us to be there during this discussion. Does September 7th work for everyone at four o'clock? Raymond, okay, good. All right. And I may be stepping out of the room momentarily during that meeting to take a very special phone call because that's the day my daughter is having her C-section. So if I have to wheel myself out of the room pretty quickly, you'll know why. Well, sort of. <laughs> okay. Um, no other reports from members of the board? Okay. Mr. Superintendent, do you have some updates for us? I do. Uh, I'll start with an OSPI award for transportation. I'm sure that uh, many in the district are finding it uh, that it is a reoccurring theme to have some type of an award in the Yakima School District. Well, transportation is no exception. After reviewing the results of a recent Washington State Patrol annual inspection, uh, our transportation department was recognized, our district was recognized uh, for completing the inspection on school buses with exceptional results. And for the past two years, the results in our district have been outstanding. Uh, a letter of recognition was received by our transportation department, uh, signed by uh, Chris Reichdahl, our superintendent of public, public instruction, as well as the, the chief of the Washington State Patrol, John Batiste. Uh, congratulations to Art Rodriguez, our transportation director, and to Stacy Locke, our superintendent of uh, assistant superintendent of operations. Uh, we're very proud of the work that is happening in our transportation department under conditions which we find very difficult to sometimes fill positions. So congratulations. And any anything to share on that, Stacy, or just a added congratulations to Art? Wonderful. All right, I will move forward then with our next uh, topic, which is a uh, basic ed certification approval. And in sharing this with you, it's uh, uh, information from the State Board of Education and it certifies uh, our district. Uh, we're now named to be in full certification of the provision of basic education, which means that our district is providing all of the state required activities and learning opportunities for students during the 2022-23 uh, school year. So we're one of 38 school districts uh, that were recognized uh, in our round of uh, making sure that we're in compliance and meeting those standards. Uh, we certainly wanted to share that with the district as well. Uh, following that, if there are no questions, I'll move to the COVID update by Jewel Brumley or Stacy Locke, but do you have any questions on the first two? Just extend our appreciation to the those sainted souls who drive the school buses every single day and thank them for a job well done and for the maintenance department as well for keeping those school buses up and running. Thank you. Wonderful. Any other comments? Okay, we'll move right into the COVID-19 updates. Uh, Jewel or Stacy? Uh, Jewel has the night off, so it, it shall be me uh, reporting on COVID updates. Is your mic on? I thought I turned it on. I'll just get a little bit closer here. So as we can see, uh, we peaked at the end of July at about 579 per 100,000 over a 14-day period. Uh, and so uh, from uh, public view, it's favorable. It's starting to go down. We are now below 500. As we move forward and look at the, the zip code rates, uh, they follow that uh, same path. The other key indicator that we do look at is hospitalizations by week. And they too, since um, July 29th, have uh, receded. And uh, as of 8-12, uh, uh, we had 15 uh, hospitalizations over by the week. <clears throat> and seven day hospitalizations rates uh, per 100,000 for the county over a seven day period was 3.9. When we look at fully vaccinated six months and up, we're looking at uh, unvaccinated at 40.2% and six months and older at 59.8. When we look at comparisons from the original uh, COVID uh, pandemic dates to 20 to 222 with Omicron, you can see how um, how they have decreased over time in different variants. 
And then we look at uh, Jules forecast. We look at uh, everything continuing since the uh, end of July to continue to uh, decrease uh, through the end of, of August. Any questions I can answer? Any questions for Stacy? I, I do have a, a I did uh, send a memorandum out today with the latest guidance uh, K-12 from OSBI and DOH. And in our community, testing is going down and um, and reporting is going down because what they've done, the change they've made is if you test positive after you isolate for five days, if you test positive after that fifth day, you now have to isolate for 10 days. A so total of 10 days or 10, 10 more days? A total of 10 days. So people are not wanting to have to take that extra week off work where before they could just mask and they could go back to work. Uh, so that that is um, causing some could cause some issues moving forward. Uh, we are, uh, our health services is starting up testing again, August 22nd, and it will be Monday through Friday from 1 to 4 p.m. The PCR and rapid tests are available. And where will that testing be? That will be down at Howie at, um, across from, I can't remember the exact address, dang, uh, across from Mel's Diner. Oh, on First Street. On First Street, yes. Okay. And this is for the general community or just for staff? This is for staff and families, all families in the community, yes. Um, again, with some of the changes from the latest guidelines that were released, uh, athletics and activities no longer are required to test as they were before. Uh, reporting of cases or outbreaks are the same as they were last spring. And so that's... That's kind of, oh, and the masking, the required masking, if you test negative after five days in isolation, you were required before to wear a mask for six to 10 days. Now it is a recommendation. We cannot require anybody to wear a mask following the negative test. So, yeah. I know, I know, and I thank <laughs> you for that. I thank you for that. So that's some of the, some of the changes moving forward. So thank you. Any questions for Stacy? Stacy, I have a question not about uh, the coronavirus, but we've you know begun to hear about monkeypox now for some time. Have we had any uh, positive tests of monkeypox to your knowledge and uh, within the school district? And is there any discussion and the need to begin to track that within the schools? There has been limited discussion. There's been a lot of questions that have been asked of our health service department. Um, what we've done is we've put on our website a link that they can click on to find out more information and a phone number to call if they have ever questions about about monkeypox. But no, it is nothing that we are tracking. Uh, and um, and far and as far as even the Yakima County Health Department has not made any recommendations to do so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Ryan? Just um, two two comments. I really appreciated the email, uh, Stacy. Um, the nine points are are very well spelled out. My favorite two are in the last two sentences of point number nine, wash your hands often, and most importantly, stay home when you're sick. I don't think we can emphasize that enough. It has been said so often over the last two years that it is glazed over and people don't think about it. But the, the wash your hands thing, it, I know in, in the very beginning when my son was going back to school, there was a very concerted effort that as students arrived in the building, they were kind of directed by staff Go wash your hands first thing you do when you get in the building. Is that, I, I, I know it's impossible to say it's happening everywhere, but is that still a directive within our buildings as uh, school is going to reopen here in a couple of weeks? At this point, no, it's not. It was a requirement based on the guidelines in the pandemic. And again, those guidelines have been relaxed. So it is just strongly recommended. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Stacy. Thanks for pinch hitting for Jewel. Um, next on the agenda, we have. I do have a few more items. Oh, you do? Yeah, you're just okay, cutting my ahead. superintendent update short. No, that's okay. No, no, that is not my intention at all. Put my foot down there. So, I mean, monkey pox, and now my time's being taken away. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I, I just wanted to add, and thank you, uh, Director Beckett, for calling out uh, how we can be more diligent and vigilant in, in how we kind of relay that message. So I, I think if nothing else, you've put it in our minds to at least have kind of a reminder conversation with our principals around that being something that we could certainly share with staff and as adults say, you know, this is something that we can implement, uh, but it certainly is not a mandate at this point. And uh, I, the other thing I would like to add, and uh, although I can't do this as a, a, a citizen or as a parent of a student in the district, it, it really needs to be said, I believe that uh, there has been a tremendous amount of work over the last three years to keep the community safe and the board should be commended for that. And I know that we're now in this relaxed state of being, and I certainly don't expect anybody from the greater Yakima community to come in and thank the board for all of the difficult times and decisions of keeping people safe. Uh, but if I could just share with you that it has been a tremendous honor for all of us to be able to um, come together and work through uh, the crisis of a pandemic and be here now at the other end, uh, knowing that uh, uh, we were able to exercise leadership in a way that none of us pre have prepared for. And I feel and believe that uh, this board and the entire district did everything that they could to one, keep uh, people safe, uh, staff, students, but also then uh, keep people employed in our community. And we're one of the few districts that were able to keep everybody employed uh, during uh, that time, all the way from, you know, bus drivers to uh, certainly our, our, our food services worked overtime. And I see that Cassie's here. So again, thank you for, for those efforts. But I, I did want to uh, uh, share that with the board and make that statement publicly uh, that uh, although you won't be acknowledged, likely it's, 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 it's important to know that uh, in this voluntary position that you each hold, uh, I believe you've done a great service for our, our students and for our community. So before I get teary now, after sharing that, <laughs> I will simply add a couple of more updates. One is that August 22nd, which is this coming Monday, we have our district opening day. And uh, I know we've had a couple of uh, directors who have expressed interest in in being there, I believe. Uh, I, don't, I think, Graciela, you're slated to be there and Director Beckett, wonderful. Uh, we have the opening speaker starting at 930. So this is the warm up act for the main performance. So that will be me. And then we have uh, Luis Cruz, uh, who's coming in to uh, uh, have a wonderful keynote uh, for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And we look forward to that kickoff and then moving forward uh, uh, in really following our, our threefold process in teaching and learning, which are professional learning community, communities, induction, mentoring and coaching and uh, principal supervision. Which brings me to my last item, and that's uh, uh, Monday morning, uh, I'm sorry, Monday afternoon or Monday board meeting start times. Currently, as you know, on Mondays, we start at 3.30 like we did today. Uh, we have um, this move to... Not today. What's that? Not today. Oh, not today. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's not Monday. <laughs> every day feels like Monday. You ever been in Groundhog Day? It's like every day is a Monday. It feels like, yeah. I, you know what? I would do that 10 times out of 10. I can't even say that that's a, <laughs> yeah, I, it feels like 3.30 still. Um, it's like a casino. Uh -huh. um, the, the, the Monday directed day, we, we have our secondary teachers gathering together uh, from 1.45 to roughly 1.45 to 3 o'clock every day, uh, every Monday. And uh, that's time to come together. And we're focused on having those teams uh, look at uh, data, understand data, uh, work to create formative assessments, uh, become together in a collaborative way. We know that uh, the greatest professional athletes that we see, the, 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 the people that achieve at the highest level often have coaches. And when you can come together in a team and be part of a team and, and work together, uh, we see better results. And recognizing that uh, the, the greatest uh, gains are made with groups of teachers who are professional and uh, strive together to solve problems, uh, the problem being how to uh, educate each one of our children who are different and have different needs and we have to differentiate for them is something that's very challenging. So we're excited about the opportunity to support uh, teams of teachers coming together to improve outcomes for our students and, uh, and, and have a better future for our community. Which means we as a executive team see a great opportunity to uh, be out in the buildings during that time, uh, not to monitor but to certainly uh, uh, show support for these wonderful uh, challenging moves that are being made across the district 
uh, in all different buildings and all different grade levels. Uh, so we would love to see, and this is my proposal, uh, a later start time on the Monday meetings uh, for the board. Uh, so moving from a, a 3.30 start time to a four o'clock would allow us uh, to then return after the elementary groups are finished around 345. We would probably leave the buildings about 330 to make sure then that we're back here well before the start time. And the people that would be most likely involved in these site visitations would be me, uh, Dr. Darling, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, our principal uh, supervisors would be out there, uh, Dr. Ellis, Dr. Page, and uh, uh, Mr. Mendez. So uh, six of us would really benefit from that and showing support for the challenging move that we're making as a district. So I'd like for the for the board to certainly consider uh, the move of a, from a 3.30 start time on, on, on Mondays to four o'clock. And this would be beginning when? This would begin September 12th. So our first Monday meeting in September. That would be our first Monday meeting in September, yeah. Is there objection to changing the start times for our Monday meetings from 3.30 to 4? No objection, but I have a question um, with our school visits. I think we're going back to on-site school visits. Does that adversely impact their schedule by pushing it out a half hour? Yeah, um, it, I don't. I don't believe so. We will double check. But what it does allow is it allows for the teachers that are involved in that process to complete with their their team time. So I actually believe it would be more beneficial pushing it out because then it makes it uh, uh, it prioritizes the the teams staying together and being together and working on on student growth and achievement. Uh, but I can certainly look at the calendar and see if there are any other conflicts that that would create. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, yes, do we have a comment? Nope. Okay. Sorry, I misread Barb there. Uh, Raymond? Yes, I, I recall the last time we made changes to our schedule for board meetings. It was based on increasing access, right, for our community to our board meetings because we did have those on Fridays at 7.30 in the morning. So. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, yeah. So... I know we made the major change. One is, again, to increase access by our community, um, uh, teachers and staff of the district, and also to encourage other individuals to run for the board. Because we did hear from community members, they were not running or participating as board members due to the, the, the schedule of the board. So I'm just wondering if that, where we're at with, with the changes, did we see increase in access? Are there more? People, so that's what I would base my. Um, um, that's what we, the board, has based changes in schedule, uh, was based on that criteria. So, um, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I think we should make adjustments when we, we need to do that. But I recall that the board using that criteria in the past. So I'm just. I guess, I guess my that. sense would be, and I don't want to speak before anyone else has a chance, but. My sense would be that having a start time closer to the end of the workday might well indeed increase accessibility by community members. Um, and also perhaps increase the attendance by staff because school doesn't get out until, well, elementaries get out at what, 3.15? staff is out at 345 that would give them time to um, make it to the board meeting if they were so inclined and i recall that the times were based on i i believe that we made it so that staff can just get out of, out of class and come right over to our board meeting so mm -hmm. i'm surprised to hear that maybe the times have changed the end of school have yeah. changed i i don't so, think i don't think it's changed for kids but it may yeah. have changed for staff yeah, so that's what I thought, that they were able to come with the current schedule, leave school and come directly to the board meeting if they chose to, to participate or attend more. Well, so, I guess, so I'm just, I I'm guess just they wondering, would be late. Yeah, I'm just wondering, has, has there been an increase? Is that still the board's priority in terms of, of changing our schedules? Do we, do, is, that, is that a factor, I guess? Do we want to include the, the community more? Do we want staff? 
do we want? I mean, so those are just questions that I have. Uh, not that I oppose the change, but it just, we did have that criteria set the, yeah. our, during Jerry? our last discussion. Sure, I just wanted to add, um, Director Navarro, I think that's a good criteria around access and certainly we would not want to decrease access to be able to be present at our public board meetings. Our elementary staff are contracted, our certificated staff are under contract until 3.45 p.m. They don't have the ability to come and be here currently when our board meetings begin at 3.30 on Mondays. They are in uh, contractual time for meetings, for teaming time, et cetera. So really, you know, even the closest school to get out in the parking lot and get here, they probably could not be here until four o'clock. So many of our staff are also um, live within the district and have students that attend our school. So it would increase access for those folks if we were to link, like start a little bit later. Trevor, do you have anything to add? I, I think that we, we have maybe two different conversations. I do understand the accessibility piece. Um, I think if we're talking about access for the community, then the board may want to eventually consider a later starting time if that's the driver. Um, I'm simply mentioning the 3.30 to 4 because that does allow us to be part of these teaming opportunities while our staff is still in session uh, logistically. And I'm, you know, I, 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 I don't want to spend the entire evening uh, in meetings, but uh, I certainly recognize that accessibility is important. So I do think that there's a conversation at some point of is four o'clock the right time or is five o'clock or six o'clock or whatever it may be. Um, I find it interesting that a 7.30 or seven o'clock start time, um, you know, I, I don't know how much, I don't know what the results are of what you saw because that predates me, but I can imagine somebody with you know children or a, a, a profession trying to make a seven o'clock meeting and see that as something that's accessible. So, I mean, maybe there's a, uh, a study that we could put together and find some, uh, get some uh, information for the board on, on what the community would feel is a more accessible time if, if the board is willing to act upon that. Because of course we do have policy that if we are to survey the community, we need to make sure that we're doing something with that information. So uh, I think that there's a greater maybe conversation later at some point or uh, maybe now on if, if uh, a date or a time even later in the day is, is warranted. But for now, the request is for a four o'clock start time change at starting the 12th of September. Is I, what, who was that? Is there objection to, at least on, the in, at, at, on an interim basis as a test pilot kind of basis, checking, um, with the board to make sure that uh, four o'clock, a four o'clock start time on Mondays is not unreasonable um, based on staff's request. I don't have any objection. I just think that, you know, something that no one really wants to say out loud, but is is a, a very real reality of, of why it is difficult to conduct this business. Uh, and it's difficult to get people, uh, whether they're employees or community members to come is because I mean, in the almost year that I've been here, I think our average meeting time is pushing three hours, and it's it's viewed as, um, I mean, it's viewed as boondoggle. It's a very long, bureaucratic, drawn out process. Um, and with all respect, staff who are contracted till three or forty five, they could go to dinner, and meet with friends for ice cream and still make it here before we were done talking on a Monday if they had something that they really wanted to talk to us about because we're still here. Um, I, I think starting later in the day is probably better as far as a community perspective, being able to get people when they're coming off of work. I, I remember when the board met at 7 a.m. and I know that was not ideal either for board members or staff or community. So I think later in the day is great, but I think we really do have to have an honest conversation about the fact that if we don't have efficient and well-organized meetings um, and people aren't aware of the fact that they can show up and they can ask their question and get an answer in their, in their um, you know, a lot of time without having to sit and wait for 45 minutes or an hour and a half to get to that point of community feedback or questions, then they're, they're just not going to show up. They'll email and they'll connect with people outside of a board meeting. But if we're trying to be accessible, 
um, you know, later in the day is great and, and really being efficiently run is, is even more important. It's just my two cents. Thank you, Ryan. Well, I don't hear any objections, so we will on a trial basis move this um, Monday morning, me Monday meetings until with a start time at four o'clock instead of 3.30. And if we could have somebody check the policy on meetings, because I think it specifies 3.30 in there, so we may want to adjust that. Thank you. All right. Looking at you, Bob. <laughs> okay. Anything else, Dr. Green? Well, that's everything. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we have the monthly financial updates with our executive director team of Becky Neeson and Jake Cooper. Cooper. <laughs> so that you can scoot as far away as you need to, right? Okay, whenever you're ready. Now? I don't think so. I'll use my, it is green, but it, oh, there you, go. you can hear me, thank you. I think you have to get kind of right on top of it. Okay. Good evening. Is it, this is your last board meeting, isn't it? Um, your last business meeting. Possibly, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> and I'm happy to be here with you tonight. To well, give you we're, we're happy to have you. Um, the financial report for July 31st, 2022. So one item of interest, yay to our technology staff, Andy Gonzalez. He um, was able to get a million dollars in e-rate revenue for the district. For those of you who don't know what e-rate is, the federal education rate or e-rate grant program provides schools based on their poverty rate, the ability to obtain affordable telecommunications and internet access. And Yakima School District has been the recipient over years for getting E-rate, and this year we were able to get a million dollars. That nice. was the great news for July. For the next slide, the enrollment. Um, this was updated last month. There has been no changes to any of the enrollment months, so it's the same as last month. And Barbie, you can go to the next slide, thank you. And again, this was updated last month as well. There's no change to where we ended the year with our enrollment. So June was the last reporting month. Here is our revenues, uh, actual versus budget over last year's and just under what we budgeted. The cash flow is um, trending as expected, the budget. And we have total expenditures. Again, just over um, last year's and under um, what we budgeted, the anticipated expenditure level. General fund payroll trend is the next slide, Barb. Thank you. And you can see the we're just above the budgeted amount. And this is the material supplies and other costs, the MSOC slide. We are well below the budgeted anticipated amount. As we get towards the end of the year, you can see the ESSER slides. I did add a piece of information. I know that this kind of gets lost in translation as we move through the ESSER funds. So I added the date the, 
the funds must be expended by. So this first slide is your ESSER 2, and you'll see that I put the 9-30-2023 date for expenditures. So we are almost to the end of our ESSER 2 dollars, as you can see in the top blue line there. So as of July 31st, 2022, we have expended 21.2 million. Moving on to the ESSER 3 slide. So you'll notice too in the header that I put in when the funds must be expended by September 30th of 2024. We have amount available at 41.2 million. We've expended 1.7 million in that top line. We have encumbered at 3.2 million with a balance at 36.3. This is the district portion of our ESSER 3 ARP funds. And the next slide is the ESSER 3 for the learning recovery expenditures. Again, these must be expended by 9-30-2024. We have 10.3 as the amount available, expended at 1.4 million um, as of July 31st, 22, with an $8.9 million balance. The expenditures within learning recovery are our after school program and summer. Any questions? Any questions for Becky or Jake? <laughs> Briefly, sorry, this will be, as we're beginning to close the, the books for fiscal year, so we will not have a uh, budgetary update for four to six weeks, roughly. So early October, we'll be on the books closed for this fiscal period, and you'll see the month of August come out at that point in time. So just to remind okay. the board. All right. Thank you, Jake. Raymond? Yes, I was just curious a ballpark figure for ESSER 1, 2, and 3 total dollars. So we're at about 51.5 for ESSER 3. And so I'm just kind of wondering, do you have a ballpark figure for all three? Was it at 85 million or around there or? Yes, okay. I think it was about so roughly 87 million. 87, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you You're welcome. for being here tonight. Yeah. We'll see you back in a minute. All right. <laughs> What? Yeah. Um, next is the first opportunity for comments from the public on agenda items. Barbara, do we have anyone signed in? No? Okay. So the second opportunity comes at the end of the, toward the end of the meeting and um, we'll wait and see. That would be for any item not on the agenda. Next, we have the consent agenda. The consent agenda is comprised of um, items that are required that the board approve either by uh, statute or by direction from uh, higher authority. And so tonight's consent agenda consists of approval of the minutes for the July 22nd meeting approval of a set of amended minutes um, from 927, 1116, 1129, and 1214, 21. And this would be at the uh, suggestion of the auditors. Um, item number four is notification of approval of warrants. And this evening we have four groups of general fund warrants, one group of ASB warrants, one group of capital project warrants, and one group of payroll warrants. We have approval of personnel actions and budget status reports for July 2022. Any board member can remove any item from the consent agenda for separate action and or discussion. Is there anyone who would like to do so? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda as submitted. Move to approve. Second. Second. Moved by Ryan, seconded by Norm. Uh, is there any discussion? 
I just had a question. Mm -hmm. The amended minutes, did that have to do more with the online meetings and just trying to go from one meeting to the next online? And I mean, in the virtual setting, right? I'm just wondering um, if that had anything to do with our, our difficulties. Barb, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, you're not on. It was during our online meetings. And what I did is um, when we exited from an executive session, I didn't put into our meeting notes that time. Um, I Because normally when we uh, exited from an executive session, we just adjourned our meeting right after that. And so when I exited from the executive session now, I need to say I exited at like 5.02 p.m. and then we adjourn at 5.02 p.m. So I just needed to put both of those times in there and I wasn't aware of that. So the auditors through Becky's team, they caught that and they taught me how to do that. And so I went through with um, President Rice and we just added that time twice in the minute meetings. Well, thank you for doing that. I know it can be uh, confusing, right, online and going back and forth. Yeah from executive to regular meetings. So thank you for doing that and correcting, making the corrections. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions or discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, abstentions, and carries 5-0, thank you. Next we have a list of approvals of, um, Item one has been deferred until next Monday's meeting. Item two, approval of the purchase of three electric buses. Stacy. Thank you, President Rice. So we have a opportunity with the Department of Ecology grant and the grant gave us an opportunity to receive three electric buses and the infrastructure to go with it. So the requested action is that the Board of Directors approves the purchase of three 36-passenger electric school buses from Shetke Bus and Van Sales in the amount of $1,213,690.68. The fiscal impact, we have $510,422.79 that will come from the Yakima School District State Depreciation Transportation Vehicle Fund, and the other $703,267.89 is awarded by the Washington Department of Equal or Ecology on the Air Quality Clean Diesel Electric School Bus Grant. Um, yeah, I kind of just, yeah, rolls, rolls away there. Um, <laughs> This allows school districts or educational, the RCW 28A 335.190 requires the board to solicit bids for items or work that exceeds 75,000. However, RCW 28A 160.195 allows school districts or educational service districts to purchase school buses from vendors who submitted an accepted bid through the state, Washington, OS, state of Washington OSPI student transportation quote system without using a competitive bid process. The, the, I've already, as I've already said in advance, it's going to be three uh, electric buses and then funding for the charging infrastructure. And it's a rebate grant, so once we pay for the buses, we will receive the grant money. Thank you, Stacy. Any questions from board members? I do. Go ahead. Um, in the infrastructure, does the grant include money for a solar charging station, or are we still going to be using Pacific Power Energy Grid to charge the buses? The infrastructure has uh, bid was awarded to Worldwide, Worldwide, I have to think of the last name, Worldwide something. <laughs> um, and uh, I would have to go back and look that up to give you the specific answers around what that infrastructure is going to look like based on, on what they can provide at this point in time. So you can get that. To I can get that information okay. for you. Yeah, I can get that out to you. I, I, would I don't be, have that I would specific. be surprised if it's solar at this point. But yeah. we'll, we'll check on that. It would 
I'm not sure we're quite to that ability yet, especially with electric buses is now just being uh, entering into the school system. Yeah, but, uh, I, I asked the question because I have I have some philosophical and some pragmatic concerns about the program in general. I understand it's um, so this came up I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about this, so I started doing some research and reading about things. And, and I'm I'm not a fan of electric cars to begin with. But I'm finding you know a lot of uh, pros and cons mm -hmm. in in general, especially when it comes to um, uh, school buses or, or busing in general. Um, also finding um, how you know school buses and that system is a uniquely North American phenomenon uh, around the world. Um, and so I, I understand that there is, you know, there's an opportunity with, you know, American jobs because these companies are primarily American manufacturers that, that create these. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm still really concerned looking at the Pacific power grid, thinking that we're burning coal to charge electric buses. And so I have some philosophical concerns and some pragmatic concerns about how that works. If we had a, the ability and the infrastructure in place to use solar to store the energy and to power these um, I think there, you know, there's great opportunity. I feel like we're just probably a little bit ahead of our skis on this um, as far as um, being able to really make it work. And then, you know, philosophically, I come back to the idea that, yes, it's a grant, but that's still taxpayer money from somewhere. And so it, it, it bothers me that, you know, it's, it seems like an exorbitant amount of money um, for, uh, for a, a, a trial run, for a guinea pig experiment, I guess is, is really where I'm coming from. So... I'm, I'm a little nervous about it. Um, I'm very curious to see where it goes. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, un until Pacific Power and you know, our local district is capable of charging these without relying on burning coal somewhere, I feel like we have a, a, a real problem there as far as accomplishing the, the, the end goal of why we would be buying these buses to begin with. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, any other questions? All right, we have before us a request to approve the purchase of three 36 passenger electric school buses from Shetke Bus and Van Sales in the amount of $1,213,000. So, let me start that over again. $1,213,690.68. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Norm, seconded by Graciela. Any further discussion? Raymond? Uh, I think our board member Beckett brings up some good points to, to think about. So I'm, I don't know, I, I hadn't thought about that, you know, burning coal to, to save fuel, right, and to save and clean air and so forth doesn't, doesn't really make sense. So I just wanted to say you brought up some good points that I think we need to consider going forward. I, you mentioned this was a pilot. Is it a pilot or it's not a pilot, right? We're just, we're, we're purchasing three buses. And the purpose of that is to go that route eventually within five years, 10 years, or what was the time frame? I guess, or what is the vision for going with electric buses? There's, there's a big push nationally across the country. The federal government is dumping hundreds of millions of dollars into um, EVs for uh, cleaner climate, cleaner air. Yeah. And, um, and so right now, this is one grant that was available at the Washington Department of Ecology. Um, this, I can say, Ryan, um, as you mentioned, solar, I'm sorry, Director Beckett. <laughs> sorry, um, um, that there's no way that we're putting solar panels out there. We don't have the capacity to be able to do that in the bus uh, transportation area. So I'm sure it must be infrastructure designed and developed with Pacific Power in mind. Moving forward, what we scrap three diesel buses in order to buy three electric buses. And so the 500,000 that we pay that comes, that is revenue that's generated through our depreciation is what replaces, that would replace normally three electric or three diesel buses. Now it's going to, with the help of this grant, uh, we're going to have three electric buses moving forward. 
of 700 is the difference that the award grant uh, will pay for. In addition to part of that grant includes um, the infrastructure moving forward. And right now we're only involved with this with this grant for three buses. I think that the conversation would be, do we move forward with additional grant funding that's available out there, um, which was part of your question, um, or do we we stay with diesel and propane? So, Trevor, uh, I, I think we should have maybe led with the fuel purchase, which is next, and yeah. what that looks like. So we should probably reorder those next time. Uh, but I'll also call out just uh, if we're looking at what's happening nationally. But if we talk just in the state, uh, on March 28th, as I'm sure you may or I guess you may or may not be aware, our governor signed into a law bill that set the date for 2030 uh, for all new cars registered in the state to be electric. So when we're talking about the national move and then also we're looking at what's happening in the state. Um, I think it's a, a great conversation and, and maybe it becomes part of a uh, legislative package or something that we take up if that's the route the board would like to go. Mm -hmm. Raymond? Yes, I just wanted to finish my comments and I understand that the maintenance costs are like doubled for a regular bus. Um, so I'm just wondering, are we, are we gonna make adjustments? I know there are only three buses, but to transportation budgets. I know we've, we've had some difficulties there in the past. So it's just something to think about. And and going forward, I'd like to, I don't know if the board wishes as well, to to get reports on how that project is going and in terms of the cost, efficiency, and so forth, and, and the direction we're headed here. Maybe, I think Dr. Green said 2030. Is that something that we're going to be shooting for at 100% or, or whatever? So I'd be interested in learning all those those details. Okay, anything else? So we have a motion and a second. No further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It carries 4-1-0. Okay, next item on our approval agenda is the approval of the fuel purchase for the 2022 to 23 school year. Stacy. Thank you, President Rice. So the requested action is that the Board of Directors approves an open purchase order to Coleman Oil and Yakima for the purchase of fuel in the amount of $550,000. Uh, the background information RCW 28A 335.190 requires the board to solicit bids for items, item, items or work that exceeds 75,000. However, RCW 39.34 allows local governments to purchase from interlocal cooperatives if they have an executed agreement between them. We have an agreement with the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services, which allows the Yakima School District to purchase fuel from a contract that went through a competitively through a competitively bid process. Coleman Oil is the state bid fuel operator for our region. And we are currently using them for our maintenance and food services departments, which will streamline and ensure we have a constant and adequate fuel, fuel supply. Thank you, Stacy. Any questions for Stacy tonight on this? Okay, the board is being asked to approve an open purchase order to Coleman Oil in Yakima for the purchase of fuel in the amount of $550,000. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Graciela, seconded by Norm. Is there any discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstentions? And carries 5-0, thank you. Next, we have approval to renew a contract with Maxim Healthcare for the 2022 to 23 school year. Jenny. Thank you, Board President Rice. Uh, this is similar to approvals I've been bringing over the last month in preparation for our 22-23 school year. Maxim Healthcare provides nursing services as um, we've discussed previously, for many of our students, 
there are potentially individual needs that need to be met as part of the Individualized Education Plan or IEP. We have previously brought uh, requests for contracts for speech language pathology as well as for paraeducators. This is a request specifically to address shortages in the nursing profession. We have scaled up our nursing staff in the district over the last few years with the pandemic. However, we still do not have enough nurses on staff to meet the needs of our, all of our students. The fiscal impact for this is $500,000 and the funding comes from the special education services budget. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Dr. Rodriguez? Okay, the board is being asked to approve the, con uh, to approve the contract with Maxim Healthcare for the 2022 to 23 school year in the amount of $500,000 to provide classified staffing support to students with special needs. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Norm, seconded by Ryan. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And carries 5-0, thank you. Next, we have uh, resolution 14.21.22, adoption of the 2022-23 budget. You're back. Yay. It does not. Oh, it, now it likes me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to present the um, resolution 14.21.22 to the board tonight to adopt the 2022-23 budget. We have followed the prescribed method uh, with the preliminary budget um, available to the public on July 8th. We did a presentation on July 26th. You held the public hearing on August 16th, or no, nope, that's today, on August 1st. And today we're asking the board to adopt the 2022-23 budget. We've had no additional comments that have come forward. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, this is pretty lengthy and there's a lot of numbers in it. So um, unless there's objection, I would just announced to the public that this is on board docs and you can get to board docs from our web page and um, we have had ample opportunity as a board to review the budget and the public has had about a, almost a month and a half of opportunity to review the budget and provide comment and we've received none to my knowledge and um I'm wondering if the board has any comment at this time, but first we'll um, have a motion. So the board is being asked to approve the adoption of the 2022 to 23 budget for the Acoma School District. So moved. Moved by Norm. Second. Seconded by Graciela. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to do ask Barb to do a roll call vote. Director Beckett? Aye. Director Walker? Aye. Director Navarro Jr.? Aye. Vice President Villanueva? Aye. President Rice? Aye. Motion passes 5 to 0. Thank you, Barb. Thank you all. Thank you, Becky yeah. and, and Jake, for your work on this. And please give our appreciation to your staff and all of the work that they put forward to bringing us this budget. I know it's not an easy task. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? Jake is like perched over that microphone. Well, I just want to say that <laughs> well, we have a few, some, a few resolutions to go over, but we. We do uh, appreciate the trust of the community and the board of directors every year when they adopt an annual budget because it is a very big thing. Thing I'm using that word purposely for an organization to do, and so 
it would be remiss not to thank the community and, and the board uh, for adopting the budget this evening for the next fiscal year. So I okay. appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. You're excused. <laughs> okay. It's my training wheels. Your training wheels. Um, next, we have resolution 12.21.22, authorized signatory. Jake. So a bittersweet resolution uh, before you this evening as it removes uh, Ms. Nissen from signatory authority, effective 9-1-22, and um, updates it with Mr. Cooper, myself, um, and also updates um, some changes at the cabinet level requested by the superintendent for signatory authority. So for your consideration this evening, I would recommend adoption of the resolution before you. Thank you. This is something that we address annually this time of year. Um, so this it, it isn't a surprise to the board to have this before us. The board is being asked to approve resolution 12.21.22, authorized signatory. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Graciela, seconded by Norm. Is there any discussion? So a question, if the board uh, refuses to pass the motion, does that mean Becky needs to stay? <laughs> <laughs> or I can't sign anything going forward. Yeah. <laughs> Either can't, one. We can't we can't spend any money. So <laughs> there you go. Becky gets to stay and we can't spend any money. <laughs> okay. No further discussion. We'll take or we'll take the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And carries five zero. Thank you. And, oh, I skipped over number six. Resolution 13.21.22, designation of auditing and investment officers. Jake. Oh, thank you, President Rice. Similar to the resolution that was before you just a second ago, this is an annual update of the auditing and investment officers. It does almost the same thing. It removes Ms. Nissen and adds myself to the uh, ability to be your auditing and investment officer. It's required by the county annually. Um, and to be filed with them each uh, summer or fall. So if there's any questions, but again, I do recommend passing the resolution as it is. Okay. Uh, the board is being asked to approve resolution 13.21.22, uh, designation of auditing and investment officers. Do I have a motion? So move. Second. Moved by Norm, seconded by Ryan. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. We've reached the second opportunity for comments from the public. This um, comment opportunity is for any... Uh, any uh, community member to come before us and can speak on any item other than, um, well, I guess any item, not just other than other than the agenda items, because, I mean, they could comment on them, and we've already taken care of that business anyway. Um, is there anyone, Barb, who has signed in for the second opportunity? Okay. All right. Mr. Superintendent, do we have a need for executive or closed session? Yes and yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. For executive session, for how long? 15 minutes under the category of current litigation with our legal counsel present. Okay. And for the closed session? The closed session under RCW 42.30.141 under the category of collective bargaining sessions, grievance meetings, interpretation, application of labor agreement. And that would be for 15 minutes. Okay. So we, I need a motion to move into first executive session and ex, then we'll exit from that and move into the closed session immediately following. The executive session will be for 15 minutes for the purpose of litigation with our legal counsel present and the closed session will be for 15 minutes. I'm not gonna read all of that. I can't, cause I can't from memory. Um, for the purposes of collective bargaining sessions, grievance meetings, or interpretation of application of labor agreement, that's RCW 4230140. Yeah. 
yeah, I would have stumbled on that. Thank you. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Norm, seconded by Graciela. Okay, so um, we're going to give folks, what, five to eight minute break? What time is it? 8.26. So let's... Um, Let's convene at 8.35, and it'll be where? Professional library. Professional library. Thank you for hanging in while we were otherwise occupied. We've reached the end of our agenda. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Thank you all. Have a great evening and a good rest of your week and a good start to school next week. <laughs>